Thank you. So Tess, uh, I have to uh, preface this to say that when I first met Tess, I was a very hungry fashion director looking for talent. And I was obsessed with finding the best talent first. And so rumor had it that there was someone who was doing production for fashion shows that was, in her spare time, obsessively sewing things. <laughs> So in the meatpacking district, I think that's where I first met you, in the meatpacking district, before the meatpacking district was the meatpacking district, um, uh, I went to her studio. And I, I did. I found this girl. And she was obsessively sewing at a sewing machine. But when I say obsessively, it was the, you know, her, the, the crux of her collection was, or there wasn't even a collection. It was just shirts. And she was obsessively, sh like, sewing on the shirts, top stitching. So in essence, you had a shirt that uh, just had all these like crazy zigzaggy lines on the shirt. So it looked very crafted and it was very expensive, but very cool. So I guess my first question is, and I never thought about asking this, but what possessed you to do that, um, you know, in your spare time and how it led you to, you know, the, the, I want to say indie brand, but you're not, you know, you're not, you're not up there in the lights, camera action. I always like to say you're very like steadfast and artistic and doing your own thing and have garnered actually a lot of respect in a very, without having to shout mm -hmm. your brand name. So, um, what, inspired you or possessed you to continue you know, to start that? I knew I wanted to have my own company. So I was I was actually doing the show production to support building my own company, but I, I wanted to do it in my own time and my own pace. So I was working with the show production to to make enough money so then I could take off two to three months at a time to develop the collection. So I always knew in my head that was my end goal was to build my own company. It was always this, like, I wanted something of my own. Um, but my way of doing it at that point, I wanted to make it very, because I had been at Calvin Klein, and I had seen things on a bigger scale, and I had seen things in a, you know, where it was very, um, everything was very refined and very clean and very modern, but I wanted to make it my own. So when I started working on my own collection, I, it was all about having this personalization with the, with the pieces and really really making my own mark. So it was, you know, that was my feeling, but it was also literally I was making my own mark by making the, the mark making that I was doing on all, every single piece. And in the beginning, I mean, I think I just wanted to, I just wanted to experiment and to really push myself as much as I could because I knew at a certain point I would, it would be more public. And at that point, when I met you, it was still so personal, and I could do anything. And I, I hadn't, I hadn't revealed it to anyone yet. And I remember, um, I mean, this is something I always tell people. Julie came, and she, she had me come up to the Barney's offices and said they wanted to place an order. <laughs> and at the time, I was like, I really don't think I can take an order. I just don't know if I'm ready to expand that much. Because I, I was selling to one store and making one-of-a-kind pieces. And Julie had to, actually, she took me aside, and she had to really convince me <laughs> that I should take the order for Barney's. Um, but it was really, it, honestly, it was Julie was the one who got me started, who kind of just got me into um, making the production, following the, the deliveries. And I think I did it for two more seasons when I was working kind of part-time on my collection. And then after that, I just did full-time. And then I started just full-on doing my own collection. It's interesting because um, um, I, uh, there's so much support for designers now um, in terms of... Uh, you know, mentorship and grants and money and um, all kinds of things. And and then there wasn't. But it's really interesting, and maybe you can comment on this, because in thinking, I've been developing designers my whole life. And so, you know, the really great talents, like the Nicholas Gasquiers, the Albert Alves, the Olivia Thaskins, 
um, the those people didn't have any of this support. Now, I can't say that today there is that caliber out there. So the thing that the only thing I can think of is it's the way that we're doing things. Um, but I'm not sure you, as a, you know, I'm not a designer. So I'm wondering how, what you think of what you were doing back then. Cause how you describe that is exactly the same way that Olivia Thaskins started, Alexander McQueen started, you know, there's very much more concerned about the craft of the clothing rather than the commerciality of the clothing. And it was a very personal thing. So, um, you know, I'm wondering, what do you feel? What are your thoughts about that? I think, you know, when I started, so it was, um, it was two, th I left Calvin Klein in 98. So I f spent from 98 to 2001 just kind of incubating it myself, just developing it. Um, and I think it, back then, you, I just, the only way to, to make it happen, I had, I wanted it so badly and it was just out of passion. And I, there wasn't any, CFDA Vogue Fund didn't exist. That wasn't until I think 2003. Um, it was just there was a there was a community of other designers, and we supported each other. And it was it was through I think peer support, mm -hmm. and just I knew in, inside what I wanted. What did you want most, though? What was it that you wanted most? For me, at that point, it was just the personal expression. I wanted to do something that was me. I wanted to, to put my own, put my own vision um, out. And it wasn't. I didn't. You know. Now I think about a company. At the at that time, I just I wanted to develop my own vision and I wanted to express it. And I knew. You know, I've always been very organized, so I did things in a organized way. But it was about just. It was about having this personal expression. That's probably why Calvin, working at Calvin, I mean, I can kind of see a creative person working there and seeing how, you know, it's done on a mass scale, but that you would want to do something that was yours. And that's how Calvin started, you know, and Ralph Lauren and Donna Karen. I mean, it's really interesting. But um, I think what's uh, interesting now is all the access that we have and like we have two really amazing collaborators that work with you and it's uh it's you know I think designers have always collaborated with people but um it's almost a part of your it's just it, it, it's kind of it, it it's a criteria in a way like who you're collaborating also is reflecting on you because everyone's collaborating I've always I went to RISD and at when I was in school, that was part of being at RISD, was you collaborated. You collaborated with painters or, gr or graphic designers or textile designers, and it was just part of this like give and take, and, and good ideas always came from working with other people. Um, so it was just very much the way that I'm used to working. And when I first started, I worked with my husband all the time, who's a painter, and it was just, you know, we started the first couple of collections. We always were collaborating. I pulled my sister, who's an artist, into it. And then we started looking out to friends who were, who were artists. And I worked with filmmakers, photographers, set designers, lighting designers. And they were just very close friends who also I respected their work a lot. So it's just like I've always known collaboration is exciting. And when you respect the other person's work, it's always good, no matter what. I don't think about what it has to look like and I don't second guess it. It's just if I respect someone's work and I like it a lot, it works out well. And so starting the, when I relaunched the new company, um, that was very important to continue that. And so I've continued it, even though now we do things, I don't sew it myself anymore. I don't, you know, <laughs> it's different. It's on a bigger scale, but I still maintain the collaborations because that's f for my heart. That's what I love to do. And that gives me so much more creatively. Um, you know, and I, I met Aaliyah, and I loved her work, and I, I asked her to do a video, and it just continued from there. And, and then through an, for, for a friend, I met Caroline, and I loved what I heard, and then I met her, and I thought it was just an instant. It wasn't, it was just this, something intuitive that I knew, and we connected right away. And first, I asked her to be in a, in a presentation last year, and then I had her do music, and then it was natural to ask her to do the music for the video. 
So it's everything I do is very intuitive. So you you have sort of an entourage of collaborators. <laughs> I've, I've had a lot of nice collections of collaborations, <laughs> but they're all genuine. They're people I, I love and I respect, and, I, and it's just a, it's a, such a natural uh, relationship. Isn't it funny because collaboration in many, for, with many designers is all about making more money. You know, you collaborate with a certain person so that it'll sell more product. And it sounds like in, in your vernacular that it's really collaborating from an artistic and respect point of view. Well, if I may interject, Tess is actually a really easy person to collaborate with too. Um, I think a lot of designers have like gimmicks in each collection or like maybe even a kind of extremely intense theme that continues throughout their collections. And I think um, in order to collaborate with someone like that, you feel like you really have to make something that goes with, you know, with the, the particular story or the theme. But Tess's work is so open that it really allows you to not only explore within your own medium, like for example, the music I did for this um, video is the kind of music I'd been wanting to make for a while actually, but hadn't had the right opportunity and the clothes presented the perfect um, way to do it. Um, but also I think it allows people to, to do something that's like peaceful and neutral and tasteful and textured and it's a really, it's a, it's a great environment to collaborate in. How, what's the, I mean, both of you all should comment, um, what's the process? Like, do you come, do you come together and say, well, what are we going to do? Or is it like I have this idea and you expand on it? How does it work? Or is it different every time? It's been, I've, we've collaborated together three times now. We've made three short little films or videos together. And I think each time started with a meeting just talking, lunch, whatever, talking about, you know, what she was working on, what I was working on, and then looking, me looking at the clothes that she was working on that she wanted to put in the video, and then, you know, just thinking about the practical stuff, like the music and the location, and all of that comes together to, you know, it's not like we're working with million dollar budgets, so you can't, you're not dreaming up fantasy worlds and making them happen. You have to work with what you have. So, the location, the music, the clothes, all of it comes together to kind of inspire what you end up with. And what you end up with is usually a little bit different from what the original idea is. Like for the video that, that we all just worked on together, I was I had this idea of spiders in my head and, and Tess had had this kind of giant crochet piece in her runway show and it kind of looked like a spider web and it just all felt like that felt right to me and now when you see the video it you don't think of a spider there's there's no there's no spiders in the video there's nobody you know the clothes aren't spidery like I know it sounds crazy but um you know the idea shifts over time and the with very each fashion step thing too, you yeah know, yeah yeah it's a fashion thing I think and I think it's a I mean if you're making films or if you're making art or whatever you're making, it always changes during the process. It always changes as you're working. You know, it's interesting because now um, I just, uh, I just, I mean, for the audience, I'm working on this very cool project for LVMH, and it's uh, the initiation of a prize. And um, it's for talent all over the world. So, and it's for really, really new talent. So what's really interesting is you have access to people that are doing things, you know, on a on a fashion level in you know places like Afghanistan or, you know, Nigeria or you know just crazy places that I would never look or you would never have access to. But the thing that I look at the most is the videos, because yeah. they all have videos, right. and so you're looking at a picture of girls or men in clothing and you're reading and you're looking at all their facts, the age of the designer and how many collections they've done, but it's really the video that speaks. And then, you know, addressing the music thing for a show, that is so much a part of the show. You can have a great show with great clothes and if the music isn't good, it, it, it can fall flat, and it can actually change your perception of the clothes. It's distracting. But the reverse, if you have great music, it can also, you know, 
it, it's so subconscious too. It, it totally sneaks in the back it, door. It, 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 like you're looking at the clothes, and if the music is heavy and hard, you don't even realize it, but you're attributing that energy to the clothes too. Like you could you could show a piece that's really dainty, and if it's paired with hard music, you all of a sudden imagine it being worn in a really specific way. Um, I'm I'm kind of new to to working in in fashion at all. And one thing that I love that designers say when they're designing is they talk about their girl. Like, wh oh, who's yeah, your girl this season? Oh and at God, first I, I didn't really understand what they I were talking about, that. but they envisualize a person and it's not just the clothes. You envisualize where it's gonna be worn, where she lives, how old she is, um, what she listens to. And I think the fashion show is the manifestation, not of just a collection, but the girl. And that plays back into marketing and branding. And it's that, to me, is actually the most interesting aspect of the whole thing. If you ever go into a showroom and someone, and this happens at a high level, and you have them showing you the collection, they'll call each, like they'll say, she, you know, she's really going to be a good seller, <laughs> or she is 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 perfect, or she's Wait, my favorite. They, who are they talking about? They're when they talking say she? about garments on a hanger. Oh, and, and I, I just, I, I just like, I got to get out of here. I, I, <laughs> I just, I lose it when they start talking. When they just put this person, <laughs> but it's that this is the she thing. I never realized that that yeah, they talk about their girl. Well, I have to say that working with Tess, she might have a girl, you know, in mind when she does every collection, but she's never imposed that on me or told me this is the kind of girl or the persona or the character that you should put in the video. It's never, she almost tells me, you know, nothing, but she just lets me look at the clothes and decide who I want the girl to be. And that's it's true. a great thing about working with people who are more interested in, in kind of the collaboration between different artists and rather than like you were saying on a purely commercial level of trying to sell this image of this one girl. Actually, when I met with Tess to discuss the music for this collection for the runway show, um, there wasn't any discussion of the girl or anything like, you know, situational or, or social at all. It was only about line quality. She was showing me Bauhaus drawings. She was showing me um, photographs from the 60s of a girl inside a huge crochet installation. She was showing me the drawings of the pieces. And I went to school for drawing, so this totally resonated with me. And I just instantly heard string, piano, digital lines, acoustic lines, lines out of tune, you know, and that the music came right out of that. And nothing to do with, is she a traveler? Is she young? Like, <laughs> what does she do? You know, it was nothing. It was just very formal and very abstract, and I loved that. But I, I can work that way because I... I, because of the people I choose to collaborate with, it's I'm very picky about who I choose, and it's always there has to be the respect, and I I like their work, and then I know it's you know, like I was saying before, then it, I can have that trust that it's going to be okay, and I don't have to say this is how it has to be, and I think that's what a good collaboration is, is where you can let go. Like for me, I come with I have the idea, and I know what my clothes are, but I don't I can't tell you what the video should look like I'm not a director and I can't tell you what the music should sound like I don't make music and I think it gets tricky when you try when someone who you know if a designer tries to direct when they're not a director you don't get the right result but if I can just let it go and really trust and then it's exciting I love not knowing what it will look like and then it's such a it's a really cool surprise to see the end result it's interesting because I think I've seen so many designers when they start, you know, in the business of fashion, pre-collections have become so important. Um, you know, those collections that are before the runway that come into the stores early, and that's actually where you can make a, a, a you know, address the, you know, more day-to-day -day needs rather than the fantasy needs in a way. Um, but... It's interesting because usually when the show comes around, collaborators come in. And what the designer told me the show was going to be about is never what they what they say. And it, I think it's because of the collaborators. How do they, you, does that, do you like that? Do you like seeing a new angle on it or do you? Yeah, I mean, I like, I like for people to be spontaneous and not get stuck and have to do that. You have to be open, but... I, that probably happens in your process, like one idea you have because you talk to her and you, and you all start to talk, it sort of morphs into something else, which really enhances the creative 
thing and it gets you away from the business of fashion and the trends and feeling all these subliminal messages that come in that you feel like I have to do that. And that's what's so important about coming up with new ideas and, and actually finding new new designs that come from yourself. I think that's what collaborations really give me is they, they continue to give me that creativity. Um, otherwise, you can get it's it's too easy to get stuck into the deadlines, the deliveries. You know that's all part of the business, and and I like that part separately. But I also know I need the creative energy to come in, and I get that through the collaborations. So it, it's also interesting because how do you tell people about you? You know, in terms of like you don't advertise. And um, you know you don't you don't have a big publicist, and um, you know you're, but yet people like how are you communicating some of these things that you do? And I'm saying that in the context of being at Barney's when we were when we first started, and you have to put it, you know, practically when people got off the escalator so that they would see it. And then you have to talk to the salespeople a lot. And then you have to try and see if you could put it in the catalog. And so it was very basic now. And now we have all the social media and visual things. So one has to choose how they do that. And that's also now I'm seeing a reflection of how you are as a brand, too. We've actually, we've social media has been great for us because it's a way for us to directly tell the story of what what the collection is, who who I am, the project I'm doing, it's it's a direct connection to customers, anyone who's interested. It's just like it reaches out directly. I mean, we still work with, you know, through PR, working with magazines, working online, and also just publications. Yeah. Um, the traditional, yeah, in the traditional, the traditional way. Sense. So I do yeah. both, but I've. The last two years, we've really embraced the social media in just being able to tell our own story. And that's been really exciting. And it's just for a brand, for our brand, it's it's also through direct relationship with the customers, mm -hmm. going to the stores, working with customers, meeting customers. And when people wear the clothes, they become fans. And it's really been this kind of just growing word of mouth and directly working with people and they, they get it when they put the clothes on, they really get what it's about. They get what I'm trying to do. And I don't have to say anything. They tell me how they feel about the clothes. And it's, that's been so exciting to see. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I, can't, uh, I can't help but think that that's going to be really important for the future. That, you know, because you see all these mass brands and they're communicated a lot and they sell a lot. But... I just, I don't know, how do you all feel about that? I mean, I'm more attracted to something, and, and today people say luxury, but luxury to me is something now that's not so easily accessible. Well, I think it, it actually, maybe this is a little bit grim, but I do see it as a luxury, especially in the future, because now that so much production is outsourced and expected to happen at very cheap prices, our idea of how much we need to pay for a shirt and what the quality of what we're going to expect has gotten very low. Like maybe, you know, a girl who's like in 25 thinks like the average price she should expect to pay for a shirt is like, you know, between 30 and 50 bucks or something. But in order to make something really well, in order to like source nice fabrics, you're not even doing something fantasy, like you said earlier, just something like you can wear every day that will last you for years, that's going to look beautiful on you. Like to do something well costs a lot more than that. And especially if you're working on a small small batch sizes and I think it's almost similar to the model for like you know organic small farms going into the future like you can't you can't compete with you know like Monsanto grown corn seed it's like it it for better or for worse is is a certain kind of luxury and why would you want to like I feel like I don't think Tess wants to be making fast fashion and selling I mean, I mean in a money way you can't compete with those prices oh oh yeah true I think it's a decision to, if you want to be really big or if you just want to be big. You know, I think that we have, fashion has this, you just have to be, to be valid, you have to, you know, be huge. And, and Everybody has to know who you are and you have yeah, to. Yeah, 
But I will tell you with every single brand that it goes in that direction, it does lose that connection, that personal connection. There's always a brand connection, but I think the kind of thing that you stand for, very intimate collaborations, um, and you have a platform, like you were saying, you have social media, you can tell them exactly what you're doing, and that's going to be interesting, I think. You know, and we do want to be big, but with integrity. Don't yeah. get me wrong. It's like we, we're we very aggressive and, and we do want to grow, but we want to do it always with integrity, always aligning ourselves with projects that we believe in. We have like, you know, with my partners, we all have very core values that we agree on. And so as, we, as we're growing and we're always talking about where we're going with the company, it's about maintaining the integrity, maintaining what the comp what what the collection's about, what the feeling is about, and it's about connecting directly with the women who are wearing the clothes. Eventually, we want to do men's, but right now, since you know, it's just the women, so men's could be really know, good. we're excited <laughs> to do that in the future. But it's really making sure that everything that we're making, we believe in, we would wear, we want to see other people wearing. There's a lot of thought and consideration that goes into it, and I, I do, I believe, as we grow, we can maintain that as long as that's always important to us. Do you ever think about Calvin? How do you mean? Do you just ever think about like how he started and and how yeah, his I mean, business grew and yeah, definitely. It was is it that's a amazing story, and I I have a lot of respect, so much respect for the way that he built his company and. That was an in, that was a great experience working there. Mm -hmm. It was such a good foundation for me, and I love how systematic, how clear the marketing was. Brilliant. You knew when you walked in where you were, mm -hmm. and it was it was just it was so thorough, and I love that. I loved that then, and I still love that way of doing things. And, you know, it really had a huge impact on me. Mm -hmm. um, even though I after that wanted to do something super super personal. Things I learned at Calvin, I still work in that same way. There's there's some things I just learned structurally um, that I still use when I when I'm working the way I organize. Well, um, we could we're going to have to continue this conversation <laughs> <laughs> off camera. <laughs> but I, I I think it's really 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 exciting, really. Exciting. Um, I, th I think it's the most important. I think it's the most exciting part of fashion. You know, I have to just say this one thing because I was in that in the fashion arena when, you know, they referring back to the Antwerp Six. You know, Margiela, Dries van Noten, Andy Mulemeister, and um, they have that those same principles. And believe it or not, the, it was like over 25 years ago, but they really. You know, and um, so I think you, all of you all have like really bright future. Those were the designers that when I was a teenager, like I used to pay attention to and wish I could buy those clothes and, you know, save up money for those clothes and Margiela and um, uh, Veronique Bronchino and Demi Lemister. Yeah. So it makes sense that, yeah, you said that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julie, Tess, Elia, and Caroline. Um, we're going to now show Tess's video for her uh, spring summer 2014 collection. And then we're going to go into 10 minutes of Q&A. If anyone has any questions, there's two mics. Uh, you can line up. And after the video, uh, you can ask these folks any questions that you may have.
Hi, I have a question for you guys. Um, my name is Michael. I, I work here um, on the sales side of the organization. And I don't know why I introduced myself like that, because it has no pertinence to my question. Oh, but I guess um, I would just love to hear all of your takes on, um, I think one of the things I took away from your guys um, speaking about sort of your philosophy and how you think about collaborating um, is maybe the idea that, that you want people to come to your store or your fashion or even your video and um, be able to express themselves through sort of the blank canvas of, of your style and of your fashion. And, you know, when I think about sort of the brands from yesteryear, right, um, sort of all the big fashion brands that, that you guys uh, were also talking about, I, I think there's something more about them wanting to, to gift you with their perspective or their sort of brand or their personality or you know the her right they want to give you the her you want they want to make you the her by you sort of exchanging with them and and interacting with them so i was wondering your thoughts on that idea of sort of the 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 thirst for self discovery even in the things that we purchase and and not um, to be defined by them but to define ourselves in that process and maybe um, how you think about that in in regards to your art and, and if that's sort of on point or not um, when I, I'm always thinking about when I'm designing, I want the clothes to become part of the woman who's buying them. The woman who wears the clothes, I want, it's, it's about bringing her own personality out, not putting on to her anything else, but it's just like, when I think about the clothes, it's about feeling comfortable, confident, Br just bringing out your, your own inner confidence is always about that and to mix it however the woman wants to, wear it however she wants to. Um, that's a that's a very big part of actually how I design, and I think you know, it's not putting something onto them, but just bringing out, bringing out the strength inside. And it's it can be really subtle, but it's um, it's always there. It's always something I'm thinking about, and I love. I see it. I see when the women wear the clothes. That's actually something that comes out because everything I do, it's about feeling. It's it's easy. It's comfortable. It's cool. And it's just about having this inner confidence. Um, Tess loaned me a, um, a couple looks to wear on chairlift summer tour, one of which I found myself going back to all the time, and not even just for stage, but just for everything. And on the rack, it looks like a white shirt with a bunch of strings hanging off it and a white skirt with a bunch of strings hanging off it, and that's it. But when you put it on, it's... I mean, I, I know this kind of idea of, like, modular... Um, modular play exists in a lot of things, with interactive websites and in furniture now. And um, But it really transformed characters. If I tie it one way or tie it another way, it could look um, angelic and straightjackety from you know, one minute to another. And, um, and even living the strings all hanging off was amazing for me because I play synthesizer on stage. And that is the most boring instrument to watch anyone play in the history of instruments. It's a person standing at a rectangle. Great. But if I have a bunch of strings hanging off me, every one of my motions, if I hit a chord, you see it translate blah, into the entire thing I'm wearing. And that was really exciting too. But alternately, I could have kind of laced it up nicely and gone out to dinner. And I think that kind of sensitivity to the wear is kind of what, what Tess specializes in. Uh, I completely agree with you. From all the clothes that I have that Tess has made, I feel the same way. I can, you can wear them in, sometimes you can wear them in multiple ways and, and totally make them your own. Uh, in terms of my own work, I don't think that I've thought much about I mean, making art, video, whether it's video art or art objects, I never think about um, how somebody's going to make it their own. I'm just trying to kind of impose my view and um, give somebody an experience. But I, I um, have recently started making perfume as well, and I think that's similar to clothing in that people wear perfume to make it their own. They don't wear it. They don't, people aren't really interested in fragrance and scent as something um, that's imposed on them. They want it to become part of them. So it's like a whole new, whole new thing to do. You spoke a little bit about pre-collections and the role of, you know, having a, a pre-collection that translates into a, a full-line fall or spring collection. Um, 
Tess, when you start designing for one of your main seasons, where do you start? Like, what's step one in your design process? I always start actually with a conversation with my husband. Um, we've, we've honestly, since college, we've been collaborating on just the ideas with, with our work together. I, I talk to him about his paintings, and he talks to me about my collections. And we just talk, and it's through talking, and we kind of think about different ideas, what we could do. <clears throat> so with the collections, and I did this with my original collection, and even when I worked at Say, I, I worked this way. And now it's just like talking and kind of brainstorming what it could be, what what would be a fun collection to build off of, and what would the show be? And you know, I, I think about what the show might be when I'm starting the collection, and then I kind of I usually start with a word, it's an idea, a thought, and I take that and I just brainstorm words from that, and then kind of ideas of well, what it could be in clothing and how I could how can I bring those into details in the clothing and and how could I build up a whole collection around it? And then what would the show be, the music, the feeling? Um, so it's just, it's a lot of words and I kind of build trees off of words and um, that's it's just my process. And I, I think I just, sometimes I make it more elaborate than I, I need to because really it's a, you know, when it comes down to it, it's a formula. You kind of know what your plan is, you know what, the, what you need, but for me creatively to maintain my love of what I'm doing, I need to work like that because it's it's how I discover new, you know, so I can kind of, how do I come up with a new shirt every season? I have to push myself a little bit more and it's fun. That makes me think about what Aaliyah was saying about spiders being a reference for her video um, because by the time I saw the video, it was kind of pretty close to being completed. I did not see anything spidery in it, nor did I hear anything spidery in the soundtrack but that I, I had made. Uh, but but I asked you to do something spidery, and you you did, and then it kind of shifted and turned into something else. But it it go ahead. Well, what I mean is, there's a process of distillation. Like you're talking about word trees, and I think often when you're chewing on the same idea and elaborating on it and trying to interpret it across so many different kinds of medium media, you you suddenly realize that it's not the spider itself that you're interested in. Maybe it's the energy of a way a spider moves, or it's that idea of angles, or it's that idea of a thing disseminating a ton of web, or the kind of quiet predator aspect of it. You find that there's like a thing, a quality to it, and you scrap the spider idea and just go for that energy. And I, I, I feel like that's what you're, you, you're talking about, and you're going for the expanding from the single word. And that's what happened, because it, it went from... I think when you said, what are you thinking for the music? And I said, I don't know, Spider. And you were like, okay. <laughs> and then it turned into kind of like more alien girl who crash landed onto a rooftop in Brooklyn and in the apocalypse or, you know, and all of that is very subtle, but that's what I was thinking of when we were shooting it. So yeah, it switched. Don't be shy. <laughs> Ryan question um, I just had a question in terms of um, how do you see your own fashions evolving from what you were say 10 years back to now like what's the difference even in terms of even your art like when you do something what you composed maybe five years back or three years back how has it changed and what do you feel are some of the factors that contribute to this change the biggest change for me is I always, originally, I felt this compulsion. I had to make it myself. And it was just like crazy, <laughs> very obsessive. Like I had to put my hand on every single thing I produced, which was great in the first two years when I was doing limited edition, you know, it was like smaller productions. Once I started producing, you know, selling more and more and the collections were growing, there became a problem because it was just, it, it was like physically, Exhausted. <laughs> this is killing me. And then I had my first child, <clears throat> and at that point I realized this is crazy, and I have to change the way I'm working because I can't keep <laughs> working this way. I mean, I would literally be working 16-hour days, and my husband, as you know, his his painting studio. We had a big loft. He painted one side. I had my sewing machines on the other side, and we both just would work. And then when we had our first child, we realized we can't work this way. And so I, it was at that point I was able to step back and I took a few years, I worked for Say. And then when I restarted, 
I knew the essence of what I wanted to keep, and that was having integrity, having the creative ideas, the, the, it was the approach that could keep the creativity, keeping the collaborations. Um, really, so there was a spirit that was maintained, but I knew I didn't have to make it anymore myself. It wasn't about me making the patterns, sewing the pieces, doing the hand stitching. I could step back and give more direction and tell other people what I wanted, what I wanted it to look like. And actually, I could be a lot more precise and um, I could I could get more of what I wanted because I wasn't making it myself. And that was a really exciting and liberating point that I got to. So now, you know, I can go through the creative process, but I don't have to be, it's not as physically exhausting. And it's a lot more fun than, than it was <laughs> towards the end. Any more? Oh. Did you have a question? Okay, go um, ahead. Also, maybe a selfish question, but you mentioned menswear. I'm just curious. Um, I think there are definitely some Tess Giberson pieces that I would wear now, but I'm curious how you th how your designs could translate to menswear. There are so many pieces that I think already that I do in women's that could just be modified a little for men's. And Even this. It's so yeah, exactly. There's a lot of and the sweaters and the outerwear. Um, when I was working at Say, I was overseeing the men's collection. And I loved it. I loved working. I think, you know, because originally I started at Calvin Klein, I was in the men's collection designing sweaters. And so I, there's something about menswear that I really like a lot. Um, I think that with my aesthetic, what I do with women's, it's not such a stretch to be able to modify it a bit. But I'm also, I'm not trying to do everything at once. I'm trying to do it the right way with this relaunching the company with my partners. We have a plan of how we want to grow. And we, we're right now just working on really getting everything right with the women's collection, the distribution, really developing the collection, working with the customers. And we need to just get a little bit bigger so we can hire someone else. <laughs> so I, because I don't, I don't want anymore to work those 16, 18 hour days. Um, so I know what I want it to be, and I also know the time I need to allow to do it the right way. But it's absolutely in the near future. So um, all men out there, <laughs> coming soon. And then we can do a video with, with cute boys wearing cute clothes. Um, our, all our dreams. Um, so thank you for hosting this. Um, thank you for the introductions. Thank you, Google. Um, maybe you'll collaborate with Google someday. I'd love to. <laughs> thank you, Google. Thank you, Google. <laughs> thank you.